You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt. And I'd like to call out to the helping spirits to be with us here today. So I call out first to your ancestors, your ancestral helping spirits and to mine. I call out to all that is good and true and beautiful in your ancestral line and to that legacy that they hold for us. May we learn to listen and may we work with them in a way that makes it easier for them to tap us on the shoulder and whisper in our air, to come to us in our dreams and to show up through others in our day that we might receive the wisdom and use it, the wisdom from those who have come before us. Manifest our own purpose in this life and bring our own medicine to the world, but to do so in a way that sets the stage for those who are coming so that what they need is here, that they might find it an easier task to know why they are here and to bring their, their great gifts to the world. So I call out to the ancestors to be with us here today to hold us in the way that the living are better able to show up and do what we have come to do in our time. And let us reach beyond the human ancestors to the nature spirits of all kinds, all the way to the greatest mountains and oceans, to the tiniest little sprite that is moving in a bee that's pollinating some something that is going to become food that you eat in this great, great, vast web of life from the tall and mighty to the tiniest little thing. We give great gratitude for these helping spirits. And we give gratitude to these energies that have been here longer than there have been humans, to those who hold the deep understanding of that which truly abides. What are those things that human beings need to cultivate so that their soul grows and they take that cultivation with them when they pass? We ask these ancestral helping spirits to help us to tune into that which is our true nature as it is reflected Uh, back to us from nature so that we better understand who we are and what we came here to do and we are more, more easily able to shun the distractions and the illusions and the lies that we have told ourselves about who it is we have come here to be. May we surrender to that deeper truth of our true nature and allow it to guide us. So as these ancestors gather around to help us to focus into who we really are in this life, let us take charge of this life by calling ourself in from wherever it is that we might be, drawing ourself from that wherever into our head. And let us coalesce our consciousness in our mind and then drop that ball of consciousness down into our heart. Take a nice deep breath there in our heart and drop that ball of consciousness down into our bellies. Taking a nice deep breath, settling deep into our bellies as we extend our awareness down to the earth and focus on the earth herself to give thanks for this day and all the wonder and beauty and diversity that it holds as we open up to that great possibility that exists in this day to the hope to the desires and to the longing that the soul feels to use this day to do what it's come here to do we give gratitude to the earth for dreaming up this experience that gives us all the challenges that we need to become the men and women that we were born to be as long as we wake up and pay attention and learn to listen to the great teachings that come to us every day from life so as we give gratitude to the earth gratitude for life itself gratitude for the deep wonder in the reality of life let us move our awareness down into the earth as that gratitude flows flowing out to each layer of the earth as we move ourselves all the way down to the very center of the earth dropping that ball of consciousness all the way down 
revitalizing your grounding cord as you move down, anchoring it firmly in the center of the earth, and opening your awareness to those energies that gain their power from that deep darkness. From the deep power within the earth that nourishes all that we have come to call abundance. We give gratitude to that which gains its strength through silence and stillness, through solitude. And we reach deeply into this energy to nourish our soul and to nourish our body as we draw the energy of the earth up, up through all the layers of the earth, into our feet, into our grounding cord, drawing this energy up into our body. And from the energies of the earth, may we come to understand who we are and where we stand, come to understand what we stand for. And what has true heart and meaning in our life. And may we have the wisdom to shape our sense of hearth and home and belonging from these things that matter in our heart. To challenge those things we have been given and make sure that they still today bear fruit. And if they do, to do those presses, to plant those seeds and to bear that fruit in our life. And where they do not, may we have the courage to open to the challenges of our time and be that beacon for what needs to change and to bring those new practices and those new ways into the world. And let us do this in a way that opens our heart and our home to others. And as we are challenged by the diversity that we see around us, may we let that challenge make our hearts bigger, our minds more open, and allow those very challenges to help us to become the men and women we were truly meant to be. And in this way, let us learn how to come into right relationship with the diverse nature within us, right relationship with nature and the environment around us, right relationship with all other living things, and right relationship with the invisible world. And in this growing awareness, may we come to understand the oneness and to feel our place within that oneness and use this awareness to be the true defining sense of right relationship with ourself. And as we settle into this awareness of this great web of life, let us draw this earth energy up from our heart to our mind and up and out, the top of our head, out into the sky above and all the weather that it holds, out through the atmosphere and out into the cosmos as you reach for the highest power of the universe. By whatever name you know that energy, however it is that you conceive of it, reach up and out and connect to it deeply and clearly. And draw this energy back down through all the layers of the sky, into your life, into your day, into your body, and into these proceedings. And in this way, we call in the essence energy of blessing to infuse us and infuse the day. We call in the essence energy of protection to move into our body and our energy body. And help to ground us to the earth. We call in the energy of the benevolence of our universe. And that which inspires and illuminates along the way. We call this energy in that we might know the beneficence of the greater experience of all things. That oneness energy. And draw that into our lives in a way that is manifest as the mentors and the teachers and the champions that we need to help to bring our gifts into their maturity and to give them to the world. And as we do this, may we feel the energies of earth and sky connect in a great column of light within us and let this big love energy inspire the spirit of our heart to awaken in our day and to open to begin to connect with the world around us and to connect deeply within ourselves to that crucible of transformation that exists in the heart. And we draw up the fiery passions of the belly and down the cool crystal clarity of the mind. And we draw these energies into the heart where they may contrast and be in dynamic and create a tension between them that gives birth to the third and most sacred thing, just some sense, some memory, some understanding of why you are here. That energy that resonates with the true beauty of your own heart. May you find courage in that heart to do something in this day, large or small, to bring those gifts into true manifestation in the world. And I give enormous gratitude 
to you for the courage to do that. Gratitude to the helping spirits, mine and yours, who help us in those endeavors in so many ways. May what needs to be said be said here today and what needs to be heard be heard and may these proceedings go forward in a way that is good for all living things. I give great thanks to those of you that are able to donate financially to Why Shamanism Now. For those of you that have never listened to the show before, the show is listener supported. And it is only because of the generosity of listeners like you and their donations through the whyshamanismnow.com website um, that the show, we've been able to pay the bills, that keep the show on the air live, and keep the archives available to anybody in the world who can access the archives um, for free. And for that help, I am deeply grateful for those of you who bring the teachings into your lives and support the show by doing it, doing the work in the world, coming up with questions and bringing those questions back to me so I can understand the new shows that need to happen as we continue together to move into a deeper understanding of how we apply true shamanic practitioners practices to our contemporary life and so for all of you that are helping me to do that i give great thanks and today as we continue with part two of what is soul loss i want to give special thanks to all of the people over the last 30 years who have come into my practice and needed soul retrieval work because it is because it is only in doing that work that i have truly learned what soul loss is and how we can do soul retrieval to repair the damage that happens in our contemporary lives to our souls. And as I said last week, there are many shows uh, that refer to soul loss and soul retrieval in the Why Shamanism Now archives, but I was surprised to find that there's only one that directly has soul retrieval and its place in modern healing in the title. And so last week and this week, um, I'm doing a two-part Uh, series of shows simply called what is soul loss so soul loss is real and it happens to humans regardless of whether you are christian muslim jew whether you're your own personal version of spiritual or you have no belief in the soul at all your soul doesn't care whether you believe in it it exists and it is possible for soul loss to happen Soul loss is a traditional form of shamanic illness, and it speaks to the fragmentation of the soul specifically that can occur when humans experience trauma and abuse. It happens when humans, it can happen when humans are afraid for their physical life, their spiritual life, their emotional life, or their mental life, or their mental sovereignty. And soul retrieval is a traditional form of shamanic healing that is designed as the remedy for this particular soul illness that we diagnose as soul loss. Okay. And so last week, um, I was able to talk about half of kind of what I wanted to talk about, about what soul loss is and how it manifests in our contemporary lives. Um. But to understand soul loss and the fact that the soul does fragment, and it's important to understand that that's different from our psychological or psycho-emotional fragmentation that creates marginalized selves. It is different from the kind of judgment and fear fragmentation that happens that creates shadow selves. And it is even different than dissociation which is caused by, by very similar reasons that soul loss is called. But it's, it's – um, so in other words, it's a very similar response to something that is a very serious threat to our life and our well-being. But the part that splits off stays in the same realm or sphere of influence of the person and observes what is going on instead of experiencing it from the body. And soul loss – is when the part of ourself that fragments from the soul clears that dissociation zone and leaves disconnecting from our sphere of influence and thus disconnecting from the space and time that we are living in. And so as we move forward in time, cope and adapt and carry on, our soul part is left behind, staying the same age it was when it left 
and for many soul parts, staying very much trapped in the same sort of um, energetic manifestation of the trauma that we left behind. It is a way that we are able to numb out, to um, forget, to simply cope and move on from something we don't, we feel we don't have any other way to change. Okay, so that's uh, the, the, the simplest description of how it is that we end up creating soul loss. Now, the important thing to understand about soul loss is the more we, as a culture here in the United States, continue to degrade our understanding and care for the soul, the more our culture continues to focus on things other than all of those activities that nourish and celebrate and help the soul to grow stronger. And so one of the great uh, challenges that we face in the United States right now, for example, which is not, which is reflected in other cultures much older than the United States, is the relationship between a kind of fundamental fear-based thinking, be it political, social, religious, it doesn't really matter, that is, is so deeply steeped in fear that the very fundamental beliefs the person holds traumatizes their soul constantly because it is it is a fear-based reality. So the soul is always held in the fear story of the mind. Even though the soul is bigger, is transcendent, and understands there's more going on, the person becomes so trapped in their mental story that the soul... Um, is unable to prevail. And so what is really meant to happen at the time of initiation, which is usually teenage years, is the soul and its purpose here prevails over the mental fear-based stories. And the soul and the heart, the heart and soul, begin to be the driving force in the life. And the mind's job is just to figure out how to do what the heart wants to do, what the heart and soul want to do in terms of um, being of use and of service and your purpose here in the world to bring your medicine forward. Okay, when we don't allow that to happen because the construct of the mind is so strongly supported by the culture that the reality of the soul is so strongly um, either misinformed, misinformation about the soul, or we so deeply believe in this lie of separation that we are so fundamentally separate from the oneness and thus flawed and broken and, and polluted, um, that it, it, it creates an environment in which the voice of the soul cannot be heard by the individual. And this leads to a great deal of what is currently called mental illness because we're not allowing uh, the – we're not living in a way that strengthens and cultivates the soul. Instead, we're strengthening and cultivating the lies of the mind with fear-based thinking and and there is basically very few things stronger in moving through the chemistry of the body than our fear response than the adrenal response the cortisol adrenal response to fear so if we're constantly in a state of fear because our mind tells us we need to be then it's very hard for something that has a subtle pervasive grace like the soul to break through that panic for chemical reasons which then of course some of you are going oh and this then leads to people reaching out for stronger chemistry be it pharmaceutical or what we consider recreational drugs but to basically self-medicate to try to get out of this constant state of fear which they don't realize they're propagating with their own mind and all of this creates the context in which the soul is not being cultivated by the choices that are being made in life. And so as your culture continues to lie to you and tell you that that's not your job and instead, you know, run these fear-based programs through your life, the soul grows weaker and soul loss is easier. The more you've been raised to understand your inherent sovereignty, your worth and your value, uh, you are connected to the oneness and it is your task here in this life to t- connect with your soul and understand why it is here and that your one true responsibility is the expression of that soul's purpose. The more you're taught that, 
by your culture or your family or your religion or whatever, the stronger your soul grows, your relationship with your soul, and you're able then in your life to make the kinds of choices that cultivate your soul. So the strength of your soul, the purity of your soul is a given. Your soul arrives pure. But the strength and the quality of your relationship to the purity of your soul with its purpose in this life, its medicine that it needs to make manifest, your, your, the strength of your soul and the quality of it are deeply affected by your choices. Okay, And that you can waste a great deal of your soul's energy in manifesting things you would in the future wish you had not manifest. Right, or and so you can waste and spend your soul's energy, and you can waste and spend the gifts your soul has to offer by making poor choices. Now, making poor choices the first time is somewhat expected. It's called childhood and learning. It's important to be on the learning curve, though, and to not make the same mistakes over and over again. It is that that is what really uh, frays the quality of the soul because the soul has been here before, it's already made those mistakes. And so the more you make the same mistakes over and over again, same choices lead to the same outcome, you hate the outcomes, you cycle back in again, the soul's already done that and you're not listening. So for most of you out there in in this, this idea around soul cultivation, for most of you out there, you have been here before and if you learned to tune in to the true voice of your soul and listen, it already has the answers for all of that which troubles you in your life. It's been here before, it's done it before, it knows what not to do and it is deeply frustrated with the fact that you are most likely doing things over again that you've done in other lives. Your soul is here to learn and to grow and to be cultivated by the quality of your choices. And this is our responsibility. And from from what I understand from the teachings I have received in this life, it is your only responsibility. You can choose to take on other responsibilities in life like children. But your first and primary responsibility is to your soul. Okay. And so... Your soul, its strength and the quality of your soul is cultivated through your life's choices. You can choose to waste it and its gifts, or you can choose to cultivate it and its gifts. And like I said, making any mistake once is called learning. Making the same mistake twice is called not paying attention. Making it three times, you are now pissing off your soul. Given. Okay? So for those of you that know, you are repeating the same chronic choices, emotional patterns, triggers, all of that, if you are not learning the skills to change that, your soul is grumpy with you. And so you wonder why it's not telling you what your soul's purpose is. Because you are not the safe person to give that information to because you're wasting the energy by making the same choices over again. It's a relationship. And the quality of your relationship with your soul in your adult life deeply affects whether or not you will continue to experience more soul loss in your adult life other than the kind of soul loss that happens just with accidents but still so you can cultivate both the strength and quality of your soul through your choices and your soul is something that you are supposed to be caring for if you don't who will okay so we talked about sort of talking about this last week talking about soul loss, what it is, how do we know we have it, etc. And one of the things I didn't go into last week was, as we were talking about symptoms and what it feels like to be in a state of soul loss, um, a couple of them I didn't say are simply, uh, you feel like there's more to life, but you don't know what it is and, and how to get at it. You have a feeling that you have a purpose, but you don't know what your purpose is. It's very possible that in the internal mechanics between you, current time you, you know, personality person, ego you, and your soul, that you have lost soul parts that have critical information for you to understand what your purpose is. And so when you come to receive a soul retrieval, you don't want the shaman to tell you what your soul's purpose is. You want the shaman to bring back the soul parts necessary 
for you to feel from the inside out what your purpose is. Because your relationship with your soul's purpose evolves over time. So you can't just be going to people periodically through your life and having them tell you what your own purpose is. It's your soul. You are meant to be in communication with it. And if you feel you are and you can't get to its deep longing and its own purpose that then ignites your passion and then your desire to manifest it out in the world, then it's possible that you've experienced soul loss around those energies. So there's the part of you that knows your purpose. There's a part of you that is connected to the source that constantly resources that purpose. There's the part of you that um, holds your soul's longing you know, to do what it came here to do. Those two things can be very similar, but sometimes in really problematic families, they get split off differently. There is the part of you that feels the passion for your soul's purpose and thus motivates you in your life to do that thing. So well, there's a lot of people that have misinformation about their passion. And there's a part of you that is connected to your desire to manifest the passion. In other words, the one that's going to get out there and do it, to take risks. That passion itself can just be a great blazing bonfire within you. And you can just sit there happily feeling your passion and um, knowing what you're here to do. That The bigger issue is you need to get off your ass and go do it. Right, And so that's the desire piece, that thing that moves you with the passion out in the world and starts calling in the other energies, the other resources you need from yourself to begin to understand how to do it and what to do. And the, and the, the unknown, the unexpected things that come in so that you can discover how to do it. Um, one of the things that I teach is I teach people about shamanic journeying in the more kind of advanced classes is the journeying stays the same. That what becomes more advanced is, is your understanding about how to craft questions and what to ask about. And so part of what you learn to ask as you've got your soul parts back and you're connected with your soul's purpose and you're connected with your passion that really, really is your human passion – for your soul's purpose, your soul's longing to do what it came here to do ignites this passion within you and then this desire to go manifest it. And a lot of times there are things you need that are out of your control completely, things that are unknown and that you need to leave space for. Sometimes you need to be patient for these things. So in other words, my point is, as you take responsibility for the cultivation of your soul and working with it to live your soul's purpose in this life, you learn to approach everything, including your divination, differently. Because you understand it's a different set of questions. You're not out there asking the spirit world, what's my soul's purpose? It's not the spirit world's job to tell you. You're asking yourself your soul. What's your purpose? Why'd you come here? What are you doing in my body? Why are we here? What's this body for? That's internal. The questions that we're asking for out there in the spirit world is how we make it happen. But, you know, we set things up, we take risks, we learn, we grow, new things come in we didn't expect, we know when to leap, when to jump, etc. Right? That's how it's supposed to work. But it doesn't work well if you've lost the parts of yourself that are part of the internal mechanism that sets you up to be in relationship with your soul in ongoing dialogue to know who you are, why you are here, to feel passion for that purpose, the desire to make it happen, the ability to take the risks, the courage of heart um, to do it in a way that is not distorted by your past loss. Okay. Not quite sure how I got on that tangent, but let's come back to what I was saying about last week we talked about symptoms, how you know you're in a state of soul loss, and then I kind of summed up what do you do? How do you fix soul loss? It's a shamanic illness. It's a, one of the most, the oldest, most traditional human illnesses is soul loss. The shamanic response to that is soul retrieval. It is very simple. Soul loss and soul, retri soul retrieval are very simple when viewed through the shamanic lens. They have a profound effect on our life, but the logic of them, the healing logic in them is profoundly simple because it comes from people who lived in a way that they had a, had a much more sophisticated understanding of the soul 
and they watched it and they could see it leave. They could see that it was gone in someone and not the whole soul, right? But enough that the person's health and well-being is threatened. Okay, so just to, let me just take a step back here. Okay, ordinary reality. In understanding soul loss, you can basically think of it this way. 50% soul loss, meaning equally here and there, here, not here, I guess I would say, is coma. Uh, And particularly persistent coma, which is why some people come out of coma, because they didn't mean to leave so fully, and they're trying to get back. Other people meant to leave, they just didn't make it out of here. And they um, aren't coming back. And so that's the confusion, the 50-50 in-between state of coma. And so when we're talking about soul loss, we're talking about fragments of the soul up in the 100 to 90% area if you need to pretend you've got numbers. And I don't really know if those numbers are accurate, but my point is – you're not really anywhere near 50%. So in the old days, in the traditional times with ancient peoples, shamanic peoples before contact with the Western world, the cultures were shaped around the practices that humans need to do to strengthen and cultivate their soul in community life. And community life was designed to cultivate individual people's souls, that the whole point of the community was not to take advantage of the individuals. And there's a lot of contemporary cultures that pretty much are driven by that simple rule, that the masses are there for the few to take advantage of. But that's not how contemporary shamanic cultures understood the relationship between the individual and the community. Cultivation of the soul was important. And so when someone actually experienced the kinds of trials and tribulations contemporary people experience, they Um, They didn't necessarily cause soul loss in the past. One, human beings wouldn't be allowed to behave that way. For example, a father was not allowed to incest his daughter in shamanic cultures at all. There were serious punishments for that. And so – and, and and it would be responded to in a way that any loss that happened to the daughter would be repaired on the spot. Any loss that was in the father that caused that action would be dealt with on the spot. So the point is they were paying attention to the soul differently. They were watching what was happening to the soul differently. And so the smaller fragments of soul loss that we experience, generally speaking, didn't happen. Big soul loss happened so that the person was often left um, in this strange kind of not really here withering away sort of illness. And it was recognized. Now, we see it sometimes when a family moves and a child really stops flourishing in the new location and they start to wither away. They stop doing the things they loved. They stop doing well in school. They they just stop being present in life. You're witnessing a child who's experienced soul loss. But in the past – In those traditional cultures, they would go, oh, kid in soul loss, let's deal with that. Here in contemporary time, we take them to get pharmaceuticals. We don't acknowledge that this is a deep wound in their soul and that there are contemporary practitioners right now who can show up for that kid and fix the situation. I mean, that's the other thing about this that is just so silly that we let this epidemic of soul loss just keep snowballing. So there's people all over the place. That can help with this. All over. Okay. Back to task. Sorry. Getting on our soapbox. Okay. So, in the past, big hunk of soul loss, withering away, people acknowledge it for what it is, soul retrieval happens. In the present time, people don't know what has happened. They mostly adapt, carry on, and it's their adaptations in the world or the way the whole keeps kind of attracting the same problems and patterns over and over and again that makes them start to seek help. So they're seeking help in the contemporary world for symptoms. This is the fundamental reason most modalities people seek to try to deal with the soul loss don't really work because they're, 
they're addressing the symptoms created by living in a state of soul loss versus the very simple perspective of soul loss, acknowledge, diagnosed, remedy, soul retrieval. Use shamanic techniques to go find soul part, grab soul part, well, negotiate with soul part to come back, grab soul part, bring soul part back, put soul part back in person's body. Person now gets assisted in how to integrate soul part. That's the process that needs to happen. And so that process is really simple from a shamanic perspective, really logical, really clean. But it can get really gummed up and messy when viewed through alternative thinking, Um, new age ideas, confusion about what the soul really is. Um, So, for example, I see it a lot like adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue is becoming a very um, common diagnosis these days. And, and that's valid. But adrenal fatigue is a diagnosis that comes out of Chinese medicine. And it can be very effectively treated through Chinese medicine. It's a very clean diagnosis, clean response. But it's being used by other practitioners who see healing through a different lens. And they gum up the process. I get people that say, I got diagnosed for adrenal fatigue two and a half years ago. And I'm working with my naturopath, but I still don't have any energy. Well, you shouldn't. It, 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 it's. Ah, you know, it's like you're working with a clean diagnosis through a system that does not have a clean solution. It's the same thing with soul loss and soul retrieval. And so I shared last week a little bit why ayahuasca, which which is meant to operate hand in hand with soul retrieval work if you're a truly fully initiated shaman in those cultures that use ayahuasca. But if you've only been working with ayahuasca to, as an ayahuascaro to be someone who is simply administering ayahuasca for people, you don't necessarily have the breadth and depth of training in shamanic healing to recognize the signs when someone's soul loss has been uncovered in their ayahuasca experience and your job is to do the healing to get the soul part and bring it back. So – problematic in in the way ayahuasca is now interfacing with our contemporary culture potentially problematic it's problematic when people try to treat the chronic problems with their therapist who may understand about shamanism may have actually done some shamanic training but therapists who do shamanic healing hang on just a moment So therapists who do shamanic healing is a situation a lot like MDs who do Chinese acupuncture, right? And Chinese medicine is a very different system of looking at the health and well-being of a person than allopathic medicine. I would never go get acupuncture from an MD unless they're also a full Chinese medicine practitioner because acupuncture doesn't fit in to the allopathic picture it's not part of their healing system i also wouldn't go get open heart surgery with someone who does chinese medicine i'd go do that in the allopathic system so the point is by taking soul loss into these other systems you start getting these complex messy half-assed answers to something that can be very simply and cleanly addressed through shamanism soul loss is a shamanic diagnosis And it has a very clean and clear and simple shamanic remedy. So, why shouldn't you do your own soul retrievals? Because soul loss occurs in the most uh, life-threatening, perceived life-threatening, soul-threatening, heart-threatening, mind-threatening, spirit-threatening moments of our life. Because the soul part left, we are not resolved around that situation. We can't be. Because the part of ourself that needs to be resolved is missing. So you don't have the perspective to go get your soul part on purpose, negotiate with it to let go of the situation that it's in, to trust and come back, to trust you to come back. You're not resolved around it. Why would the soul part trust you? You're not there yet, right? Bring the soul part back. Actually get it back in your own body. It's really hard to blow your own soul part back into your own body. I mean, just the mechanics of it don't make any sense. And it's really easy for a trans-shamanic healer 
to do this for you. And there's no shame in asking someone to do it for yourself. I'm really good at soul retrieval. I don't do my own soul retrievals. Let that sink in. I don't do my own soul retrievals. I ask for help because that's the way the diagnosis and remedy work best, most completely and most cleanly. With that said, spontaneous soul soul retrieval does happen sometimes. Okay, and there's other shows about that in the archives. And if you're helping spirits bring a soul part back to you, if you stumble on a soul part in your shamanic work, when you're in a journey state, absolutely grab that soul part and ask your helping spirits to return it back to your body. Treat it as a true soul retrieval and integrate that soul part. Don't dismiss what's happening because I've said don't do your own soul retrieval. What I'm saying is don't go do it on purpose. If you stumble over it as part of the answer to some question that you're asking or some process that you're in, embrace it for what it is. Make sure your helping spirits blow it back into you so it actually gets back into your body and do the integration work. Those are two very different things. And if you don't understand the difference, you need to go back to school about journeying because those are two very different intentions in your journey. Okay. So. As I said last week, and I've actually said on many shows, many, many shows, we fragment in many different ways. So loss is only one of those ways. Okay. Um, But the important thing is when it is soul loss to deal with it through soul retrieval work. And so what I want to share is what my helping spirits have taught me about this work. Now I, I trained initially in the how in the technique of soul retrieval work with Sandra Ingerman. And then have evolved in my practice since then through the help of my helping spirits, who of course would not have had anything to help me with had I not had people willing to come to see me as clients. And I am deeply grateful for all of those people who have come to me over the last three decades to do this work because I would not have learned what this really means practically in the reality of contemporary people, because I can read about the past, but we're not those people. We're these people. And we experience soul loss very differently. We experience it in smaller amounts that we adapt to over time. And then we experience more loss and we adapt. And we experience more loss and we adapt. And because we are given time between the moments of soul loss, like sometimes years, to adapt to the loss that we've experienced, we live in a cumulative state of soul loss that should have killed us. That's how severe the situation is. And so you wonder why you don't know your soul's purpose. Why your kid who goes off to college ends up horribly depressed and grossly over-medicating, over-self-medicating with who knows what, instead of actually focusing on the beauty and the light you see in them and the purpose that they have in the world. Why do contemporary people behave like the soulless idiots? Because they're in a state of soul loss. They are suffering. And many people are living in a collective degree of soul loss that should have killed them. But it didn't because we had time to adapt. And for that reason alone, we as contemporary people receiving soul parts back need to integrate because we need to unadapt. And for that reason, we also, I feel, as I talked about in last week's show, we need to receive soul parts back, integrate them, allow ourselves to be changed by that, to unadapt, be, return to a, a truer essence of our original self, and then receive more soul parts back. And that this, this goes on uh, over a period of time. Because we, we need to be honest about and address the fact that the reason contemporary soul loss is different from the past is we experience it differently with this time to adapt in between and thus end up in a more problematic place, ultimately, usually by the time we're 18, 19 years old. Okay, I was going to say something else about that. Oh, well. Okay, so... 
as I said before, traditionally, uh, when a soul retrieval would happen with indigenous, by traditionally, I mean coherent shamanic cultures pre-contact. Okay. Often there are, there are many different traditions around soul retrieval. There's a spirit canoe tradition um, here in the Pacific Northwest, etc. The point that I want to make about many of these rituals for soul retrieval is that they are often an all-day affair that they often involve the entire community. The entire community gathers to witness the shaman's journey off to find the soul parts and to negotiate with them and to bring them back. Um, And often part of the role of the community is to be present with all of the things the person loved in life and to, to fill the space that the retrieval ritual is happening in with what that person loved. If they were a hunter, then it's filled with the, the tools for hunting, with the, with the results that the community gains from hunting, with all everybody's spirit animals get called in, that, it's, that if it's about hunting, then if that's what the person loved, then the room is filled with that. If it was someone who was a child who loved music then there's lots of music and instruments and and so the whole point was in a sense the community's job is to remind the soul why it wants to come back it's to celebrate life and to encourage this wandering soul part to come to not be afraid to know that the danger has passed and to be welcomed back into all of the pleasures and the joys and the celebration of community life. And this was particularly important with children. And usually, especially in indigenous cultures, it is children that experience soul loss, unless we're talking about battles with crazy sorcerers. Okay. So it was in many retrievals in different cultures of child parts, of young child parts, the shaman hardly had to go anywhere. The mostly the shaman just created an energetic bridge to the part and everybody threw a party and said, come on, don't you want to be here and do all your favorite things? And all the kids gathered and everybody's just coaxing the scared soul part to come back. Another traditional place that a soul part would get lost would be in a dream. And in this case, the shaman would definitely uh, journey and dream into that realm to find the part lost in the dream world because they're not lost here. And so just coaxing it back into the ordinary reality isn't going to work because it's not in ordinary reality. Um, It isn't in the spiritual equivalent of ordinary reality. It's now in some dream world reality that may only be true for the person. And so the shaman has to go find that. Um, So uh, the important thing to understand, as I've already been saying, is the difference then between this way traditional soul retrievals were done and the, and the need to mount this big community effort to make it happen because it was an event of big loss. And that's very different than us today where we have small events still have a big big loss but not necessarily such huge size. And one of the things I notice, for example, when I'm bringing the parts back into my heart – to bring them back into space and time before I put the parts back in the body of the person is I can feel the size of some parts. Some parts are really gigantic. Others are kind of what I consider normal, normal soul part size. Some are smaller than that. But every once in a while, one is huge. And it's like all I can do to contain this part in my own heart before I put it back in the other person's heart. But my point of all of this that makes contemporary people different from traditional people other than all of the cultural issues that make us different is that we are given time to adapt between soul loss. And so we adapt to living in a state of soul loss and that becomes our normal. Okay, so in the past there would be no real need for integration because it would happen very close to the time the part left and that's still true today. I mean if you have a car accident, pretty sure there was soul loss, you get soul retrieval really immediately after that, then not so much of a need to integrate. If the car accident was five years ago, need to integrate. If the car accident was 50 years ago, need to integrate. Okay. Um, The other thing is that, as for reasons I've already explained today and yesterday, there is need for more than one session. You know, often I'll have a soul retrieval session with someone, it goes well, and the person, you know, many years later was saying, well, but I already had a soul retrieval. 
It doesn't work that way. <laughs> As I've explained, that a lot people who are really wanting to be whole, it, just as an example, this isn't how you have to do it, but an example for a lot of people with me, they'll have a session, they'll integrate over the next couple months, they'll sort of live into that to establish their new life for maybe a couple more months, two to four more months, and then maybe four to six months later, they'll have another soul retrieval. And so often people will have maybe two soul retrievals in a year and maybe in that same sort of frequency, another soul retrieval in the next year. So over two years, maybe they have three or four soul retrievals. They integrate that. They change. They go on with their life. Things are very different. And then maybe three, four, five years later, I'll hear from them and they'll have another soul retrieval. And then maybe three, four, five years after that, another one. And so, the again, as I described actually at length yesterday, it's this sense of integration, becoming more whole, and in that process of living more true to yourself, getting to a place where you're capable then of receiving other soul parts back because now you're the one who can integrate them. Now you're the one that can help them to feel safe. Um, okay, so what will change? What can you expect to actually have change after your soul retrieval? Okay, so the first thing to understand about soul parts coming back is there are two energetic, distinctly different energetic phases when soul parts have come back. The first two weeks and then everything after that. In terms of integration, I talk about it as the first two weeks and then the next six weeks. Soul part integration, if you pay attention to it, usually takes a couple months to happen. Okay. It's easy to be fooled by the first two weeks because there's this – once a soul retrieval has happened, you know, the soul parts have been found. They've been put back in the body. So the loss is no longer a loss. It's no longer this hopelessness and despair around this loss. The energy is reinduced into the body. There's a big infusion of energy. And so there's a big kind of high – there can be. A big high. Not everybody feels experiences that, but the point is, the energy is much more present, one way or another, for the first two weeks. And what happens in that time is the soul part energy that influences the physical body, energy body, that dynamic, and the spirit itself are automatically reintegrating because they function on automatic. We don't run that show through our conscious choice. We affect it, but we don't run it. So after that first two weeks, that reorganizes itself and it's done and it can be quite a profound experiential shift from that first two weeks to the rest. Now, most people consider their integration done at that point. Even some practitioners see it that way. And this is sad. This is a great loss because what remains to be integrated now is the, is the part of the soul loss, part of the soul loss that is actually shaping your reality, which is the emotional and mental dynamic in how this soul loss has affected you. And that energy does not move automatically. As you know from your own personal work, you have to poke it. You have to talk to it. You have to work with it. You have to use different practices to get it to move. And it's true with soul parts as well. Now, I give people a, um, a, an internal conversation, questioning, embodying the answers kind of process to do. But the important thing is that has to be done on purpose or it isn't going to happen. Now, the good news is it can happen at any time. So if you've had a soul retrieval, you didn't do this, you can go back. Your soul part's probably still sitting there wondering what the hell happened to you and is happy to communicate with you and make that – finish that process. So once a soul part is integrated then, what you can expect from your soul retrieval is a kind of pervasive but perhaps subtle change around the patterns of energy that were set in motion by the soul loss. So a change in, for example, a pattern with authority or a pattern with intimacy or a pattern with um, safety, feeling safe and protected. And so the, the change is not necessarily big and bombastic. It can be very subtle, but it is pervasive through your physical, emotional, mental and spiritual being through your physical body your energy body and the change is fundamental 
You're not trying to be different anymore. You simply are being different. That's what you can expect from so and it and it literally changes your life, right? And so because your soul parts are coming back, these gaping holes in your energy body are being uh, sealed, filled, and sealed, so that you're not hemorrhaging energy out where you've experienced soul loss. For many people, there's also a change in their general perception of fear and sort of safety protection in life. And because they are now sort of fundamentally feeling safer and more protected in life, not so vulnerable in a scary bad way, they're actually able to open in their heart to what I consider a more true choice of vulnerability, emotional vulnerability versus energetic damage vulnerability. In other words, if I had a gash in my side right now, I would have a vulnerability in my physical body to a lot of things, pain, blood loss, um, bacteria and things coming in. You know, It's a vulnerability that is not the kind of emotional vulnerability we're really looking for. It's kind of a technical vulnerability based on a wound. We would like to heal that kind of vulnerability, technical vulnerability, and really open to emotional um, heart-based vulnerability. And we would like our mind to surrender and be open to possibilities it doesn't know about, to the unknown. All of these kinds of mental and emotional vulnerability are are choice-driven and are enormously valuable, if not necessary, for our health and well-being. Uh, but we we have a very hard time choosing to go there if we're stuck in a state of energetic vulnerability that is unhealthy, that kind of technical vulnerability. Okay. Soul parts return with gifts. Now, sometimes the gift is just energy and it starts to restore chronic um, depletion and exhaustion and fatigue and sort of chronic low energy patterns. And those energy patterns can really become fundamental of just chronic depression as well. And so the gift that soul parts bring back can just be energy and all soul parts are energy, but there can also be access to specific gifts in your life like intuition or inspiration or passion, like I was talking about before, passion, desire. So soul parts may bring back your connection to nature, your connection to your heart, you know, who knows. So gifts come back that are that were yours, that you were born with, that you've lost access to. As you integrate soul parts and release the old emotions and the old stuck patterns of emotion, what you gain from that is emotional flexibility, emotional range, a kind of holistic emotional healing that gives you your emotional wisdom back, your whole emotional life back, ultimately, as you receive your soul parts back. This, in turn, and the, and the, the strength and cultivation of your soul and the healing of your kind of stuck emotional patterns, gaining your emotional life back, all leads to a much more full-hearted, healthy, heart-based experience in life. And um, this same thing is true with your energy body and your, you know, your energy body health in life. That, that soul loss is so fundamental at the core that it creates that sort of technical unhealthy vulnerability in your energy body, your physical body, your emotional body, through everything. It's soul energy. It touches and affects everything. And so when we get a soul part back, there's not only the direct resolution of the soul loss and the psycho-emotional issues there, but the repair then allows all these other systems of our body to settle into a more natural health and well-being state. So our heart is able to become more wholehearted. Our energy body becomes fundamentally more healthy. It's an enormous restoration of mental health and wellness because trying to understand how to be healthy and well when our deep mind actually knows we're missing parts of ourself, there's big holes and gaps in what is going on in our mind, leads to a kind of crazy-making scenario, which is then this fundamental 
kind of crazy making place that our um, mental unwellness begins and our mental unwellness unravels more and we end up with mental illness and so as I've as I've already said in this show there's an aspect of chronic illness and physical health that is deeply affected by um, having soul parts back and reestablishing the integrity of your energy body which helps to reestablish the integrity of your physical body and can help with chronic illness it's not necessarily the only part there's a lot of physical factors that are involved in our health and well-being but I think we underestimate the effect of soul loss in our health and well-being okay so ultimately that your soul's purpose which is the cornerstone of your well-being can be restored through getting your soul parts back if that's something you really have lost connection with it may just be getting enough of your soul back allows you now to finally feel collectively to feel the resonance it may not be um, directly what that soul part is carrying but many people are raised in challenging families so much so that they hide their purpose because they're afraid it's going to get broken somehow in the mess of the family system it's not uncommon these days so my point is that your soul's purpose which is truly the cornerstone of your well-being that your the health and well-being of your mind and your heart and your body your soul have to do with knowing why you are here and making choices in your life to manifest that in a way that connects you to something larger than yourself in a way that is good for all living things that this brings human beings into a state of high health and well-being and the bottom line is you need all your parts to add up to that uh, healthy uh, felt relationship with your own passion and your soul's own true purpose and so this is the fundamental reason that soul retrieval um, needs to be an option on your menu for what you are willing to reach out and do uh, to maintain your health and well-being and to live up to your one true responsibility which is to do what your soul has come here to do so I want to give thanks to the helping spirits that have taught me these many things Um, and I give gratitude to the ancestral energies for gathering around us here today for the earth below, the sky above and the heart that unites all of us in this way Registration for Mass of Illusion and all of the other classes, the weekend classes here at Last Mass Center are up on the lastmaskcenter.org website. You can register through the calendar. Um, we have a new class, Advanced Actual Energy Clearing, happening September 15th through 17th in Portland. It is also on the website. And I'm just letting you know there's one more chance to complete the prerequisite for that course, which is an um, actual energy clearing, the first class online it's the first time we're offering that and you can go to the website and contact andrea at lastmasscenter.org for more information about that it's kind of a you need to contact her so we can invite you to the class because of the online platform and so that would be considered a prerequisite for the advanced class so thank you everyone for listening have a great week